and we're so early in this stage, you know, of what we do. Like all bond trading, all equity trading will be done on the blockchain. This idea of an exchange, it will, will disappear. I'll give you a good example. We did a, between a major Canadian chartered bank and a major global asset manager, um, we created digital wallets for both of them. One had $4 million tokenized bond position. The other had $4 million of QCAD. We had 68 people in the room. This is five years ago. 68 people in the room. We said, okay, everybody blink. They blink. And the $4 million was in the other wallet. The $4 million of bonds was in that other wallet. We said, we just did a $4 million bond trade in T plus under two seconds. And we go on the Ethereum block to either scan, say it costs us two tenths of a penny to trade $4 million in two seconds. Why the heck are we paying? <laughs> 330 basis points to advise. It's like all respect to all my advisors who are all my good friends and trade bonds as long as you can. But you know, the world, the world is changing and this is all digital assets. It's all blockchain. It's all Bitcoin. It's, it, you can't deny it. It doesn't go away. All right, welcome everybody to another Resolve Riffs. Today, we, uh, I think, have a very timely guest in an exciting field. We've got Fred Pye joining us, uh, the founder of 3IQ Digital Assets. And uh, not many people know, but Canada was on the cutting edge of um, uh, providing exchange-traded products to individual investors for access to the digital space long before the popularized BTC ETFs have been launched in the United States. Fred, it's great to have you here. I think it's a fantastic and timely discussion. Uh, welcome. Great to see you, Mike, again. And thank you, Rod, for both of you for having me on your call. Great to Amazing. Have you. So why don't, why don't you uh, take us back through a, a walk down memory lane over the last nine years? Uh, you know, pre-call, we were reminiscing about getting together nine years ago at uh, the ETF conference and at the uh, fledgling beginnings of both of our, our firms and, and um, you entering the digital asset space, us, us entering the multi-asset space and, and uh, you know, having lots of uh, hope and dreams in our eyes. And, um, you know, your, your business obviously is absolutely caught a, uh, a massive wave and, uh, and, and there's been corporate developments on your side that are quite exciting too. So why don't you bring everybody up to speed on your journey for the last nine years, and then we can get into some more uh, recent content. Yeah, well, you're, you're right, Mike. I was, uh, you go back to, you know, 2012 to 2014, 15, I was managing a multi-asset momentum portfolio with a group at Lander Investment Management. Solid laundry, and we were just using price momentum, which was really simple for investment advisors. That they, you know, we look at sixteen asset classes. And we say, well, we just own the best seven all the time. Like it's very simple. It's nothing complicated. That's that's what we do. And you presented what you were doing at Resolve, which was such a a, a a dynamic and creative, a next level on top of what we were doing at Landry. And then I said, well, what about Bitcoin? They go, yeah, yeah, we're we're not there yet, and and in fact, there was no way for a regulated or a public fund to invest in Bitcoin back in in, in that decade. And uh, with our friends at Ark Invest, uh, Chris Bernisky, Jack Tater, Kathy Wood, and everybody else, we said, well, let's write a prospectus and let's list the first Bitcoin fund in the world. And uh, we started that in 2015 when we met in Florida, and. That was the beginning of a four and a half year and $5 million venture to uh, litigate and, and take the OSC to a public hearing. And on October 31st, 2019, we became the first regulated Bitcoin fund in the world on a major exchange. And that was very exciting. We went from zero to four and a half billion in the next 12 months, even through COVID um, and everything else like that was success. But you know, we've just come through a really big crypto winter and, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm on, not at my prime years anymore. So I actually, you were talking about corporate developments. We've just sold 51% of three IQ to a very powerful group out of Japan called Monex group that owns CoinCheck trade station, in the United States. They own a uh, Monex brokerage in, in Japan. They also have operations in, 
you know, obviously Singapore or Hong Kong, you know, and other places in the world. Um, but they're also partially owned by NTT Docomo. So what I look at for the next few years of, of, of my company growing is I have 1.9 million potential customers in Japan and the United States. I have a hundred million cell phone users at NTT. So, uh, it, it's kind of working with a, an audience that, uh, you know, is clearly youthful and, and dynamic and are looking for next generation investment type ideas like Bitcoin. Amazing. So the, the, the sort of the global adoption, how would you characterize that? So you're on the cutting edge in Canada. You worked with the regulators. Um, it was challenging at times, but you finally came to successful outcome. How have you, how have you seen that as you, you know, sort of trotted the globe and, you know, become involved, uh, in other areas of the world with respect to digital currency adoption and, and maybe, you know, you can speculate on why it took the United States so long to come around to adopting some sort of more public opportunity for investors to, to participate in this asset class. Yeah, well, I'm going to be pretty blunt. I think the U.S. had studied it for 10 years and, and very good friends at VanEck and obviously Fidelity, which is my pedigree and, uh, and ARK Invest and the rest of these amazing fund producers got it right by going in the front door and trying to file, uh, and for an ETF, which should have been approved many years ago. But you had this big black hole, which was grayscale that raised $50 billion or 30 to 50 billion plus from my ass, you know, on a non-regulated platform that all of a sudden magically became regulated and regulated, you know, became a re converted into a regulated ETF, which, you know, I think everybody in the U S should have been put on the same scale. Everybody starts at zero and and move forward with the regulated. What they do with the non-regulated product should have been their own decision. So I'm a little controversial when I say, you know, uh, the U.S. got it right by approving ETFs. I think they got it wrong by allowing a magical conversion. Um, but having said that, you know, all early adopters in the world bought GPTC, which was one of the only products available for many, many years. Uh, on a platform that was tradable in the United States. Um, their structure of closed end funds was different than the structure that we opened up in Canada. Canada's closed end funds always had a redemption feature, a monthly and an annual redemption feature, uh, redemption at net asset value. So you always knew that you could get out. You're not getting in, but, but GBTC did not. And their only hope was a conversion, um, at the end. So that happened in the U S and, um, uh, but. I think our experience in Canada, Mike, as you would know, is just be, when we won our court case, the court said, we are, the OSC is not the only gatekeeper. You know, one of the points the OSC says is, oh, every grandmother and aunt and uncle and, and, and poor kids going to be buying Bitcoin. And the OSC said, we're pretty sure we're not the only gatekeeper we have to rule in your favor because you have legally constituted a proper product. It's up to the investment dealers and the investment distributors to determine whether it fits within the requirements of a client's portfolio. And in Canada, with one exception, investment advisors have not been able to put Bitcoin ETFs into their discretionary portfolios. Having said that, that's why with $4 billion in Canada, We've looked uh, offshore, we've looked into Europe, the Middle East, the Far East, and, and that's where our business will build. We can't grow a massive business in Canada. And in the U.S., you have too many competitors and, uh, you know, we can go into that later on. But, but the, the reality is, is as, as a Canadian company, we've really got to go global. But it's the same in the United States, just because the ETFs have been approved, you can't buy them or an investment advisor running discretionary books cannot buy a Bitcoin ETF for the discretionary clients. The best way for most investors to get ex access through discretionary accounts is to buy a fund that participates in Bitcoin or in Ethereum or anything along those lines. 
And that way, through their diversification of those investment tools, they get their exposure to digital assets as opposed to buying it themselves. Yeah, pretty exciting opportunities for, for diversification in the portfolio as well from, from the standpoint of uh, adding the asset, high vol asset, but uh, also been a high, re high return asset. Is there, um, is there any other sort of areas of the world that have been particularly friendly on a regulatory perspective besides maybe Canada? H have you, th that you, yeah, um, not really. I mean, Australia has, but Australia be, you know, you know, embraced it kind of right at the bottom <laughs> and they couldn't get, they didn't get a lot of momentum into it. Um, Europe has always had what are called exchange traded products, CTPs, which aren't necessarily backed by Bitcoin, but they're backed by a debt instrument and whatever supports that debt instrument adds another layer of risk on top of already a risky asset. So we actually think the ETFs are better in North America than the ETPs in Europe. Um, but having said that, we're still at the early adopter stage, you know, I just spent a month in Switzerland and the Swiss, the Swiss family offices and the Sw major Swiss dealers aren't looking for sophisticated digital asset products. They're still saying, explain to me again, why I shouldn't have big exposure for my client. So when people say, you know, when's the top of the market? Well, it's when the taxi driver and everybody, you know, owns Bitcoin and every pension fund has it and everybody has we're nowhere close to being at what we consider a maximum capacity of buyers into Bitcoin. The interesting thing about our asset class is, is a fixed supply. And here you are, you bring in a day like today, two and a half billion dollars of buyers of Bitcoin, only 80 million to $120 million of Bitcoin was created today. So you got to find somebody that's going to sell you $2 billion worth of Bitcoin and there are no more buyers. That's why in, you know, when the US ETFs came out, I'm sorry, and I like to ramble. When, when the US ETFs came out, uh, Bitcoin was 49.5 and they all came out and Bitcoin fell promptly to 39.5 and everybody said, oh, that's typical buy on rumors, sell on the news. That's not what happened. What happened was you got a billion dollars of buyer, but you had $5 billion of redemptions coming out of Grayscale. So the sellers outweighed the buyers. And then once those initial sailor, sellers came out of Grayscale, all of a sudden Grayscale yesterday had $20 million of redemptions or 200 million, whatever the number was small, but you had now $3 billion of buyer. So now Bitcoin's gone from 39 to 62, 61, you know, in, in the last couple of weeks. So if this continues and follow comes in, you know, I'm not going to make a price prediction, but you know, we're yeah. <laughs> a bit over here. So I, I, yeah. I think we've got, uh, especially with the having of the supply growth, right? I think Bitcoin looks really good. Right. And, and I mean, in comparison to, you know, gold as an asset class that's been considered a store of value for few thousand years, you're probably one tenth the size, I think, uh, approximately of, of, um, of, of gold as an asset class. So if it's going to, if it's going to rival that as being maybe the new digital gold, which is uh, potentially an arguable way to look at it, it's got some upside. Plus you've well, got, as you say, the, the, this, the, and I don't think people understand how, how locked up people were in GBTC at a massive discount for so many years. You know, I think the year before that discount was 30 or 40%. So if you wanted out and you wanted to sell on the open market, you were taking a discount to the net asset value of that, um, that ETF of, of a third to, or more of your portfolio. So as that gap closed, there was a lot of pent up demand, um, for, you know, money and, and whether those folks recycled it or just wanted some of their potential, um, you know, uh, returns back that they had been sort of trapped in is, is a, you know, a, a source of flows a little bit, but that seems to, as you say, attenuated. And now you've got a couple billion in flows and it's a, now we're in this positive reflexive situation where upside begets more FOMO, begets more buyers, begets less supply and so on. So it, it is an interesting thing for Bitcoin. And how do you think that bleeds yeah. into the rest of the ecosystem? 
Well, first of all, I'm just, I'll add one more point to Bitcoin. Yeah. <clears throat> Bitcoin is a store of wealth versus gold. And I'm a big believer by gold, by Bitcoin, because I'm not a fan of the stock market giving these debts and interest rate potential. And, you know, it's just been like, we've had what a 25 year bull market. Like you can't be, mm. you know, your RSP can't be happier with its global diversified equity funds mm. itself. Then <laughs> everybody's trying to figure out how do we make m more money with less risk? Well, right now buying stocks is more risk and probably less money, uh, you know, in, in the future. But when you talk about store wealth, store wealth boils down to the scarcity of the commodity. Gold grows at 4% per year, meaning gold at 2,000, 2,100, 2,200 has a 4% increase in the supply of gold per year. Bitcoin right now is at 2% per year, which is twice as scarce as gold. But at the end of April, it goes to 1% per year of growth. So arguably Bitcoin is 75% more scarce, you know, going forward than, than gold is, um, and arguably it's more portable, arguably it's, uh, and everybody says, what backs gold, uh, Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin's backed by the single largest, most powerful secure computer network in the world. When somebody says that's worth zero, I just say, yeah, knock yourself out, but. You can't have a hundred million plus computers using 4% of the world's energy running a program that's worth zero, right? I mean, any cloud guy would be excited to have something to power Bitcoin. Um, but your question is, where does it run into the, the next of the ecosystem? There were so many people in the early days of Bitcoin, they say, well, I love blockchain because I understand the technology, but I don't like Bitcoin. Well, that obviously is in our, our, you know, a redundant kind of sentence. Um, but having said that, we've seen massive developments in Ethereum and Ethereum going from a proof of work to a proof of stake now pays the yield. And obviously both our, our Ethereum products, both the ETF and the closed end fund, um, pay a yield, which means why would you buy an ETF that doesn't stake in Ethereum? When you actually get paid to hold Ethereum in, in any of our, our, our products, that puts the whole management fee argument, you know, uh, in another bucket. But, uh, you know, Ethereum has been, been great, but now you've got what they call, train call the Ethereum killers, which are, you know, the Solanas, the Avalanches, the Cardanos, the Tezos, the Stellars, the Polkadots, the, the, the rest of these companies. So. We invest a lot of time and effort and research into researching what will be those powerful blockchains or what are the use cases for those powerful blockchains? Because the difference between the internet and blockchain is you can't own the internet. Your only way to get access to ownership of the internet is by Google, Amazon, Uber, and everybody Meta. else. <laughs> Meta, anything along those lines. Whereas... All of the applications that are built on top of a blockchain is coding. There's no competitive value, but you have to pay to use that secure internet. And you can actually own the secure internet. When people realize that it's the single largest technological investment of our lifetime, we think we have a long way to go. Yeah, I, I, I'm always, I'm continually perplexed by the banking system by the banks holding my money, charging me for it and, and providing, you know, a service that arguably is far less, uh, easy integrated and, and far more costly than, than, you know, transferring value via blockchain. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an interesting set of circumstances that it, as you get into it, you're kind of your head tilts, but it's like anything you've got to have adoption. The first fax machine wasn't worth much. But when the VAX machine is ubiquitous and everyone's doing it, and that's kind of happening probably one death at a time as it usually does. I don't know if you, you heard that Piper Jaffrey survey from a year ago, but, uh, they survey sort of kids in that, uh, in their, in their teens and early twenties. And they survey them about a whole bunch of things, different products that they're using, whether they be athletic products or makeup or whatever. What was interesting is almost a quarter of these kids in this age cohort owned some sort of cryptocurrency. All right. So the cohort, they didn't own Vanguard's S&P 500 and their parents didn't give this to them. 
right? The kids from 12 to I think it's 21 or 22 years of age, a quarter of them own some form of blockchain. That is mind to me. That's mind blowing. That is like, um, that's who is getting a year older every single year and is already adopted this. And can you imagine when some 12 or 14 year old from two years ago turns 18 and gets his bank account and starts to look at, wait a second, you want me to pay you to send money somewhere and you're going to hold my money for me. And this is how it's all going to work. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? That's the most insane thing I've ever heard. Now, the, 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 the question on that, honestly, is what percentage of those children turn into from gambling on FTX and these coins that nobody knows about to the recognition that they need to maintain their money and that a ETH rock may not be as valuable as something that's more robust. Like there's going to be a transition of these younger kids to something hopefully more robust. I mean, they're going to start putting their money into financial assets as well. Uh, but think, Rod, you're right. Th think about it for one quick second, right? Not every 25 year old has a, an offshore bank account in yeah. the Cayman Islands. However, every 25 year old starting an RSP and starting a TFSA. Yeah. So they're not going to go on to FTX. And that's one reason we won our court case was a Quadriga CX disaster in Canada. Right. We told the regulators, it's your job to protect these 180,000 Canadians that lost $250 million and stand up and regulate. And that's why we won. But I, I, I like your train of thought, Rod, continues. Yeah. So, I mean, the question is, you know, what is real and what is a value that these kids under 20 are going to have to start doing their homework and realizing because right now YOLOing on an asset that's going up and you're buying it because the price is going up versus truly understanding the fundamental reasons why it might be a reasonable crypto coin. I mean, what is the education that needs to go on there, both from a regulatory standpoint, protecting the investors from the education that they need to know what the difference is between an ETH rock and Bitcoin? Like, how is the industry moving that forward? Well, you're going to laugh at this because my son, when he was 15 years old in 2014, um, got a scholarship to go to a nice university, uh, college, uh, sorry, prep school in the United States called Andover. And he went to Andover and his allowance was 200 US uh, per month. So the first month I wire him 200 US and the phone rings and he goes, dad, I thought my allowance was 200. I said, I said, it is. He says, well, I only got 160. I said, well, let me look at this. Oh yeah, CIBC took 25 and Bank of America took 15. So you get 160. He goes, no dad, that's not how it works. I go, well, kid, that's exactly how it works. He goes, oh, what do we do about this? And I said, well, open up a wallet over at my friends at Coinbase. And uh, next month I send him one Bitcoin for 200 bucks, send him one Bitcoin. So he goes, bing. He goes, wow, that was easy. You got one Bitcoin. Next month, you know, uh, I, uh, Bitcoin goes up a little bit. So I send him 0.9 Bitcoins and he calls me up. He goes, dad, you only sent me 0.9 Bitcoin. He says, uh, you're supposed to send me one Bitcoin. I said, no, Bitcoin went up. So I get 0.9. He says, no, dad, that's not how it works. I go, yes, yeah, and that's exactly how it works. <laughs> Anyways, you think about this kid in 2014, kept two years of $200 a month in Bitcoin. Put in your mind at 60,000 per Bitcoin, what is that kid worth? What's that kid worth now at 25 years old? Buy a house, right? Yeah. Period. And but would he spend his Bitcoin? Can, no. Right? I mean, you could have made a lot more money in many other, I would say. Oh, I don't think you could make more cases. money than that. I think you, I think you could, if there were other use cases like GMO, uh, what's it called? The GameStop and, uh, and, and other. No, no, you trade. No, he, he does not. He does not. You were talking about what does youth do? Youth does not spend Bitcoin. I am the dumbest guy on the planet because I spent 2012, 2015 showing people you could spend Bitcoin everywhere. Right. That's right. Seventeen dollars. You went around and actually dinner. The lottery. I've got, I've got, I've got one Bitcoin sweatshirts, t-shirts, one Bitcoin running shoes. Like, it's so ridiculous. It's sixty thousand dollars. It's nuts, right? So the the other interesting thing, though, on a rod is how many of those kids right now, like, just to counter your point, right? You you can buy stocks. You can get in trouble in stocks. There's there's 
stocks have been around for a lot longer. There's there you talk about AMC, talk about uh, BreX, talk about the great financial crisis and the financial engineering that nearly bankrupted the whole global economy. It doesn't matter if you're a kid or an older person, you can screw things up majorly. The difference is, in my mind, what blows my mind on the Piper Jaffrey is they don't own stocks, nor did the generation before them. Go 10 years before, go 20 years before. How many kids owned a stock? How many kids owned the S&P 500? A very, very, very vanishingly small group of people were even aware that there were financial instruments of any kind out there. So now you have a group of a, a generation who somehow of their own volition with their own money, whether it's via the video game world where there has been this fungibility of, of things on, on certain platforms where they've, they've been into the digital space and been early adopters, and they're going to have 10 years under their belt of being in this digital space, 10 years of learning hard knocks and things like that that they have no idea of, and they're going to have experiences like Fred and his son, where they're like, I sent you 200 and you got 160. Okay. So Fred, here's a question. <laughs> how do you, how do you disaggregate the world of crypto between Bitcoin, Ethereum, and everything else? Do you, do you think that everything is as valid as Bitcoin, Ethereum, but it's just years behind? Like wh where are you, where do you stand between those two things? Yeah. It's, um, first of all, I don't think anybody over 30 has the brain power to, to understand what these kids are talking about when they talk about, like, when I look at the list of research stuff that my kids are looking at, you know, we've got WorldCoin, we've got, you know, uh, uh, you know, Compound Radix, uh, you know, all of these kind of things going, yeah, what are you talking about? And as a lead portfolio manager of a research group, I just smile, listen to these guys, and I say, how could I have put together such a brilliant group of young people? And that started back in 2014, 15, where I had a bunch of kids in my basement at university going, okay, we've got Bitcoin. We know Ethereum. What's going to be the next best thing? And Francis Pouliot always said, then in crypto, because it's open source, the next best thing is going to be the next one that was created because they know how the last one was created. So they're always going to create something better and smarter. And for all intents and purposes, when Solana came out, there were already 2,000 different cryptos, but they made it faster and cheaper and a higher yield and, and cleaner and, and everything along those lines. It all got caught up in the, the hype of FTX because it was at the same time of FTX. So you end up with two groups. You end up with a bunch of fraudsters, the lending guys, the overstretched guys, the leverage guys, all of that kind of stuff. You know, they get wiped out and all of a sudden Dolana gets carried down in that because everybody who's buying it on FTX and all got seized that everybody's going, what happened to Solana? But Solana is such a powerful future blockchain of, of, of future use cases. So what we actually do is we look at the use cases. Why does somebody use Stellar? Why do they use Tezos? Why do they use Polkadot, why do they use Cardano or Ethereum? Or what about these ERC-20 tokens? Or what about the metaverse? Like the number of things that we look at, how many money managers in the world are doing what we do right now? Like they can't even start. But most of the graduates that want to do their CFA are trying to figure out how do I turn my CFA into an, a, a proper analysis of the fast and growing asset class in the world. And that's dealing with digital assets. And, and stable coins changes the whole game because when, when people talk about stable coins, they say, oh, it's crypto. You know, that stable coin is worth a dollar US or it's worth a dollar Canada. So we have the Canadian dollar. We have something called QCAD. So I can send you $10,000 of QCAD right now from my phone to your phone. You're done. We've just done a transaction. Not three days, not two days, not banking, not letters of credit. Who's, what account is it going to? It's my wallet to your wallet. I give you $10,000 Canadian because I lost it on a golf bet because Mike's a better golfer than I am. Um, so, so, <laughs> so many things so, wrong with that statement. You know, I can't even start, but good enough. <laughs> 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 but anyway, 
But but the reality is moving money around the world, which is arguably at $4 trillion a day, the single largest industry in the world. Now, how do you create a stable coin? You create it on the Ethereum blockchain or the Stellar blockchain or the Solana blockchain or the Polkadot blockchain, or you create it on those blockchains. And when those blockchains are creating and minting these dollars that are being moved around the world at some point in time at the tune of a trillion dollars a day, it's all going back to that transaction cost is going to the owners of that blockchain. So if you own Bitcoin or you own Ethereum or you own Solana or Tesla or Avalanche or Algorand or whatever, you're going to all know. So we have to analyze which blockchains are moving the future processes online faster than the others. And that's what we do for a living. And again, my hedge fund that I created, and I think you probably own it, it, you know, it's been around for five years. It's got a five-year 57% compounded annual rate of return for after expenses and all the legal jumbo that I have to put in there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's spectacular. And there's nothing in the traditional TradFi world that comes anywhere close to what we're doing in digital assets right now. Yeah, I just say it self-declare. Yes, I do. Own that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yes, it's, uh, it has been a wonderful it's... contribution. Sorry to interrupt, but I did want to take a quick second to remind listeners that while we do absolutely love providing our audience with world-class guests and weekly investment insights, we wanted to remind you that we actually do our best work outside of this podcast. And we try to do this by providing cutting-edge, globally diversified and systematic investment strategies that are designed to be broadly non-correlated to traditional equity and bond portfolios. So we actually manage private and public funds, as well as bespoke separately managed accounts for investors that seek the potential to smooth out portfolio returns in the long run. So if you do wanna see that theory that we've been talking about put into practice, please do go ahead and check us out at investresolve.com. Now back to the podcast. And so those use cases that you mentioned happen to be in the kind of, uh, right in the financial world, right. if you're making money based wow. on the amount of volume that it, as you're moving money around the world, making, reducing the frictions, making it easier for people all around the world to be able to transact and do business globally. Um, <laughs> have you seen any use cases outside of, of finance? That Absolutely. Really you? Let, me, um, let me give you one perfect, and Rod, this is a great way and a great segue. First of all, full disclosure again, Drake, you own 30 some odd percent of a company called Stable Corp, which creates a digital assets, their partnership with Mavennet. And I invested and we uh, work for a company, we own a company called um, Neoflow. So think about this. And it's seven years ago, the Department of Homeland Security comes to, uh, to Mavennet and say, we have a problem. Canada exports X million barrels of oil out of the United States. The United States imports X million barrels of oil from Canada. Those two numbers don't match. So where's Canada sending all that extra oil? Well, if you're Department of Homeland Security, you're concerned. Where are we sending it to? Like, where? Where are we sending it to? So they said, is that a distributed ledger slash blockchain potential solution? It was seven years ago. Where five years of development, NeoFlow now has the oil and gas passport, oil passport between Canada and the United States where all importers and all exporters have to track their trade on a blockchain. Okay. Now they said, well, work for oil does work for gas. And can we include Mexico? And while you're at it, can you look at lumber, wheat, steel, uh, every copper, every other commodity that Canada trades with the United States. And can you maybe think, can we do this with China and Hong Kong and Japan? and the rest okay. of Europe. So all global trade one day will be tracked, not by any one government lying, which they all do. It's gonna be tracked by one immutable, immutable blockchain, which is a ledger. It's all of this is a ledger that nobody can change. Once the data is inputted, it's there. So can, it can, can, be I, can I just double click on that? Cause I want the audience to understand the value there. So. Yeah. First of all, what you're saying is that whoever, there is a ledger, but there's a Canadian, before this coin, there was a ledger where there's a Canadian ledger, there's an American ledger, and they didn't match up. There were two single entities, governing bodies that claimed to know the truth. 
and yet there was no way to tell what the truth actually was. Now, exactly. in a distributive ledger, you have the idea as a network where everybody ha in that network has to agree that this, this is a real number. So how do you go from, you know, you're still having to, uh, to gather data from somewhere. Well, how did they build that bridge, the solution of, of getting enough players to create a distributed network to, uh, to, to pull the correct numbers and come up with, a, with the correct amount of trade happening? At any yeah, the, there is a website that explains all of this, but let me give you an example. Uh, the best example is you're an exporter of oil exporting millions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of oil. And you're going to get a X percent discount in your tariff rates and your trade rates because you're putting it on the ledger. Of course, everything goes on the ledger and everybody has to. And companies that don't put their exports and their imports on the ledger are going to get penalized. So there are incentives for the big ma major people. So whether we're talking about ConocoPhillips or Suncor or any of the biggest oil companies in this country, they're going to support this kind of initiative. But again, it crosses commodities across this. Now, where does, you know, where does uh, NeoFlow make their money? Well, apparently we own the blockchain and we get a piece of the fees that are going across on every barrel of oil that's traded. Now that's not a big number. It's 0. 0.000 something. But that 0. 0.00 something on every barrel of oil will add up, especially if you start now including every country in the world and then start including. Now, this isn't going to happen, certainly, and I'm an old guy, so maybe not my lifetime. You guys are young, so maybe yours. But, but you know, these are the kind of global changing applications that are going to happen. And, and the same with property or real estate. You know, if all the real estate in Ukraine was listed on the blockchain and, you know, you would always know what you own because it's an immutable ledger and Russia can steal a property, <laughs> but they can't necessarily take it because you are the owner. Now, City Hall there with your records that you bought and own that property, that's gone. City Hall's disappeared as burnt and it's gone, right? So who know, who has the data of all the real estate owned in Ukraine? Well, if it's a block, it's on the blockchain, can't take it away from somebody. It's immutable. It's there forever. And I think these are the kind of things that when you just start to peel back the, the onion, it just goes on and on and on. And we're so early in this stage, you know, of what we do, like all bond trading, all equity trading will be done on the blockchain. This idea of an exchange, it will, will disappear. I'll give you a good example. We did a, between a major Canadian chartered bank and a major global asset manager, um, we created digital wallets for both of them. One had $4 million tokenized bond position. The other had $4 million of QCAD. We had 68 people in the room. This is five years ago. 68 people in the room. We said, okay, everybody blink. They blink. And the $4 million was in the other wallet. The $4 million of bonds was in that other wallet. We said, we just did a $4 million bond trade in T plus under two seconds. And we go on the Ethereum blockchain, Ether scan, say that cost us two tenths of a penny to trade $4 million in two seconds. Why the heck are we paying 330 basis points to an advisor? It's like, like, like all respect to all my advisors who are all my good friends and trade bonds as long as you can. But you know, the world, the world is changing and this is all digital assets. It's all blockchain. It's all Bitcoin. It's, it, you can't deny it. It doesn't go away. You know, one of the things that I found, uh, I find interesting about the space is that what you mentioned is when you are dealing directly with the blockchain, those are the types of things that you can do. And I can see institutional, like large governments and institutions dealing directly with that. Uh, but we have these intermediaries that these Coinbase's, the FTX's, the, that, that act as a broker dealer, that take a commission that, uh, you know, you're still get to paying big fees when you want to send money out and then maybe not as big as the large banks, but it, the, in, the intermediaries take it back to the old school versus going directly into on the blockchain. So what's, yeah. what's the role in the ecosystem? And I mean, a lot of the, the claims of benefits from blockchain <laughs> kind of go back a little bit when we're doing, when we're using these intermediaries, no? Well. And this leads up to my, you know, my, 
good friend, Michael Saylor, I call him my good friend. I've met him. Did our vibe. Like I have, like, he's, uh, he's my idol. He's four years younger, my junior, but, uh, you know, I, I think he's one of the most remarkable human beings I've known. You ever know Michael? Michael says, yeah, you can get access to Bitcoin through buying micro strategies. You can buy Fred's ETF. You can buy it on a wallet in Coinbase, or you can directly buy it and keep it on a ledger or a treasurer and everything else. He says, do you notice that I don't tell people how to buy Bitcoin or what they should do? He says, all I say is just buy Bitcoin. There are different reasons that different people, even at 3IQ, we have a closed end fund and we have an ETF. And the number of people that can't figure out why should I buy the ETF or why should I buy the closed end fund? It's very simple. If you want to trade it and be actively getting in and out, use an ETF. If you're a hodler and you want to buy Bitcoin every quarter or every month or every year for the rest of your lives, you buy the closed end fund because there's no activity. The costs are very, very low. You can always get out once a year at NAV if you want to get out, but you're also buying it today at 3% discount. So you're saving at 30 basis points, you're saving 10 years of management fees off an ETF because you're buying at a 3% discount. So this argument about fees and everything has more to do with how you should be getting access to this product. So I'm a big believer in what Michael says. I think people need access to the space. We hope that we have you know, the proper product line, um, you know, for the space and, and, you know, Rod, you know, we, we, we've talked about this before people like Julius Baer in Switzerland, or, you know, it will be JP Morgan, believe it or not. And some of the other things you're going to be able to buy it in your regular brokerage account and not even buy an ETF. You'll be able to just buy Bitcoin uh, and you, you can at uh, well, simple in Canada, for example. So, right. um, there, there are different ways, cost effectiveness and everything cost effective on something that's up, what 160% here over are like, like 1% or 0.5 or whatever it's costing you to do it. Well, we used to pay 3% commission on buying a stock, right? So, so it's a, it's so much more important on what stock you buy and what time of the day did you buy it or what your commission, your $50 commission went in or went out. It's, it's. It's, it's using the advice. We like to say, you know, we fought the hard fight in Canada and we think people should dance with the girl that brought them to the dance. And we brought Canadians to the dance. We think we, sh we should be your natural choice of saying we fought the hard fight. We spent all the money. We took all the risk. You know, we'd like you to support us in Canada. But again, there's many choices right now. And that's great. I want to see the industry at trillions. I, you know, my market share will be my market share, which I'll, I'll arm wrestle for and scratch and grovel for, for, but I've been groveling for assets for 45 years. Dance monkey dance. I hear you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what, what I'm thinking through, so, so Bitcoin, obviously pervasive, lots of, lots of exchange traded products, getting more and more access points. How do you think that trickles down? in the U S to, uh, products that will be legitimized by the regulators, let's say for Ethereum, do you think that the U S is going to allow the, the sort of staking strategy that you've executed in Canada? And then beyond that, what, when are we going to yeah. get to a market cap weighted ETF of, of, of coins and, and maybe some active management that's, that's, um, and I know you maybe lay out, we do you that. Guys yeah. have we, in, we, ob in we obviously do that already, but the chance, so here's our battle with the regulators right now, right? The regulators in the U S are trying to decide whether Bitcoin's a good thing or a bad. Thing. That's the wrong decision for a regulator. Mm -hmm. A regulator's decision is this properly constituted as an investment vehicle under the laws that currently exist. That's why we won, because the answer was yes. When the regulators approve a prospectus for a gold mine and all they have is dirt, they're saying they think there's gold in the ground. It's not up to the regulator to say, hey, we don't believe there's any gold in the ground there. We think you just got dirt, right? When the regulators start to decide, oh, we're the decision makers or we're the asset managers, they're going, no, 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 you're wrong. 
right? If we properly constitute, it's not your decision on whether Bitcoin's better than Ethereum, better than Solana or Cardano or everything else like that. Now, do the regulators, should they approve what we call privacy coins, Monero, made by drug dealers for drug dealers, and they didn't mean that uh, facetiously. The, you know, there are privacy coins that can be used for reason. When everybody says Bitcoin's used for money laundering and for and criminal activity, that is so small right now because Bitcoin's 100% traceable. So only stupid criminals use Bitcoin. There are 15 other coins you can direct people to uh, that'll do them. Like, do I want coin? Am I going to list coins with pet names or anything else like that? No, I'm the asset. They're creating stuff. You know, you know, I'm looking at reputational risk here. Like, I'm not going to be the issuer of shit. <laughs> Excuse yeah. the uh, technical uh, financial term. You know, um, you know, we really look really hard. And, and as I said, when you see the next slew of products that come out of 3IQ, you're going to go, well, this has been really well thought out. It's, we're not the first in, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the game and saying this has a better chance of being very successful over the long run, which is what our investors and our institutions should be looking at. So when you think about Bitcoin and the, we're talking about a hundred plus trillion dollar market, uh, a market that tends to lean towards indexing. Uh, your your equity, your bonds, you know the uh, the market capitalization weighting. When you're asked what percent of your portfolio should be in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and whatnot, wh how do you think about that problem? A hundred percent. But like, why would you buy stocks? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, you got to talk your book. I mean, I can't blame you for that. No, <laughs> no, no. It's you know. Well, well I mean, one thing about 3AQ, all we do is digital assets. So to get me to think that what's, what do I think is better in the next five years, the S&P 500 or Bitcoin? Well, I'm going to say Bitcoin. But uh, apart from that, all financial advice comes from your investment advisor. Your investment advisor that originally bought 1%, that went to two, that's now five, it's up to seven. He's going to say, let's peel back and go back down to 3% of Bitcoin, and we're going to put 2% in Ethereum. And then all of a sudden, they're going to say, maybe we should include Solana because we've added, we've doubled the total return of our portfolio in the last five years by including digital assets as an asset class with a minimum of 3% position exposure. So when, when Mike, as he said at the beginning, it's a volatile asset class, yes, but it's non-correlated volatility. Where do we think interest rates are going? We don't know, but Bitcoin's interesting because it's both a risk on asset and a risk off asset, right? Is it a store of wealth or is it a, is it a speculative, you know, digital asset commodity? It's both. So I think the risk is having zero exposure to digital assets when people are still in denial that it's a trillion dollar asset and it's a real asset, it doesn't go away. All it is, is an internet protocol, like live streaming, but you can own it. How much has live streaming grown in the last five years since we've known it? I, I, I get all these live streaming. Everybody wants 10 bucks a month for Hulu and for, <laughs> for every live streaming thing, right? Well, you're paying for that. Where, whereas, you know, the secure value transfer protocol is like the BitTorrent protocol was the precursor to live streaming. It's an internet protocol, voice over internet protocol. These are all free protocols, email, and they're all protocols. The value transfer protocol is also known as the blockchain and Bitcoin, but you get to own this protocol. So now you actually get to own the most powerful protocol of all in the evolution of the internet. And people will continue to be in denial that it's an internet protocol, but that's all it is. We get to transfer money around the world for free. That's crazy. <laughs> of course, I'm a bank and I'm saying, oh, you can't do that. Well, you can. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, of course, they're going to say, no, that's dumb. That's a dumb idea. But of course you are. You know, so, you know, we've got to step out a little bit and say, are we 100% wrong? I doubt it. You know, are we 2% right? Maybe so. Put 2% in and get off zero. Hashtag get off zero.
Right. The get off zero is the, uh, the big, the big one there, right? If, even if you don't know, if it is something liquid, it, it is in the world space, it seems to provide an uncorrelated return stream is the question is, is the answer zero? Um, is the answer a hundred percent, uh, Fred, I don't know. I don't know about oh, that. I get that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just, well, you know, that there's was not, some, that was not, there. investment, you know, was not it's investment uh, advice, but I do have a grin when it goes up a thousand dollars in the side. Yeah. Pascal's wager. You know, I, I, I want to ask Mike a question. Over. I think uh, I saw his beautiful face on uh, BNN in Canada and he was making his recommendation. I think he turned the switch on to Ethereum about nine months ago or six months ago. Uh, or one of yeah. our one of our close out plants, and I think that he uh, I don't Most know what your other picks were like at the time. I don't remember, okay. but I think we've done okay. So yeah, you've you've always done okay. I, I I mentioned it when you know when there was rumors of the ETF coming, and uh, it was a winter I was on in January of twenty three. I said, you know, get off zero. That's exactly yeah. the the same thing. I said it's 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 um you know it's it's an asset class whether it's one percent or. 3% or 5%, whatever that is, and, and, and rebalance, like just rebalance. Don't let the tail exactly. wag the dog if you're nervous about it. I think investing in crypto assets is no different than investing in other assets, uh, you know, whether it was the tech bubble, whether it's the current AI boom, um, you know, you have to preserve your gray matter. And can you take a period of time where you go down 70, 80, 90% and, um, and, and suffer those kinds of consequences in your portfolio? And if you can, and you have the time uh, to do that, th that's great. If you can't, you remember just, you know, the gray matter in between your ears is the most important thing that you should be preserving in any investment endeavor. So, you know, write down what, write down what your rules might be. And if it doubles, are you going to have it? Or are you going to, are you going to sin a little as, as, uh, as, um, uh, Asnes says, or I think it's Arnett or Asnes, but sin a little, you know, maybe, maybe let, maybe just under rebalance a bit or let it be a little bit more as it, as things go on. Um, you know, they're, they're all approaches. And I think, um, I think Michael Saylor's onto something, you know, I'm, it's not for me to tell you how to buy it, you know, getting off zero is probably some pretty good advice. And what percentage off of zero that is, is going to be a very personal choice based on your investment preferences. So that that's where you either take that on yourself or you're going to involve an investment professional in making those decisions. So, so um, one other question I, with I, regard I, to the global, go ahead. Well, global movement of uh, Bitcoin to help you transact globally. You know, if you, if you have a counterparty that's willing to take stable coin or Bitcoin, that sounds great, but I haven't been following this at all in the last few years. How do you then like how, how much easier has it gotten to transfer and convert those crypto assets into real currency in to, to the traditional uh, finance uh, banking system? Yeah. It, it, it's it's last, really last easy now. It's very, very difficult. Was it Silvergate? Yeah, really and, no, you, no I, again, you don't need any of these fancy banks or anything. You go to PayPal, you go to any of the Canadian exchanges, any of the money service providers, you interact e-transfer into your crypto account and then you cash it out and you e-transfer it back to your bank. It's all traceable. It's all taxable. You're going to get the tax, you know, slips. You're going to have to do everything. It's so above board now. You know, you can onboard it. I think Stellar had an amazing agreement with check, uh, check cashing, the instantaneous check cashing people around the world, whatever, you know. But, you know, people like, you know, all the big, global money transfer people, they don't want to, they, they still charge like they were using SWIFT, but they're all using Bitcoin or, or crypto payment rails, whether it's Ripple or whether it's another payment rail to move money around. Cause we just move it around so easily and so free enough. I've been renting a boat up in Antigua the next couple of weeks and, you know, trying to get 15,000 US to a guy in the US. In, in Antigua, it's impossible. Like, it's just ridiculous. And what PayPal charged him because he didn't have a digital wallet is silly. Whereas I could say, I'm renting the boat, being there's 15K US, you're done. Um, watch stable coins. Stable coins are really going to be the leader on how, the, how this all happens. And it's going to be Q Japanese yen, Q USD, Q CAD. It's going to be Q Euro. Money's going to move around really fast on stable coins. Now understand the stable coins, what we call a layer two. 
that layer two is built on a layer one. So that stable coin is getting minted on Ethereum or Bitcoin or Stellar Solana, any, any of the, the other ones. So you have to be, so you still look down into what's going, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, one bubble that came up really quick was the metaverse, for example, metaverse, there was an awful lot of enthusiasm. It's going to take a while for that to go back because there's too many real world solutions now, real world assets, tokenization of real estate, tokenization, you know, of, of, of cash flow streams, of any kind of, you know, royalty payments, all of this tokenization means we can do it quicker, faster, and cheaper, and, and it gets done properly. So there's a lot, a long way to go. A lot, Rod, we haven't even started. Yeah. Beautiful. What an amazing, I think it feels like a reasonable place to, uh, to, yeah, uh, night end. We, it's been a, it, it's, um, is there anything we haven't covered Fred that, that, that you wanted to make sure that we did? I think we covered a little bit of the staking. We didn't get too deep into the staking process, but I, you know, I think you guys have got some good information on the three IQ sites on how you guys are doing that and that sort of thing. If people are interested in that and getting a yield on, on their yeah, Ethereum. To, let me just articulate that a little better. So. Okay. The Bitcoin blockchain is protected by something called proof of work, which is why there are things called Bitcoin miners. So Bitcoin miners power and protect Bitcoin network to make sure every transaction is validated. On Ethereum, they used to be a mining used for Ethereum, but Ethereum went to proof of stake. So the people that currently own Ethereum can stake that or post that Ethereum as um, a validator. So if you're going to use my Ethereum, if I've got a thousand Ethereum and my Ethereum is with what we call a validator that's approving all the transactions at a very high rate, I'm going to get paid 5% or 4% for staking that Ethereum to power and protect the network. All the major blockchains after that are staking. So whether you're talking about Solana or Polkadot or whatever, you actually get paid to own the network because you're powering and securing the network at the same time as owning the asset. And I think that that's a real good way to look at it. When we do come up with a new product, like such as Solana, we'd love to, you know, go into you know, the details of why Solana was a choice of 3IQ um, to, to create a product or talk yeah. out or, or any of the well, others, but whatever it may be. I don't want to get too yeah. deep in the weed. Yeah. 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 So. But, and you have Ethereum already. And really, when you explain it like that, it, it makes sense. You don't want to have your Ethereum sitting in cold storage. It doesn't actually do the Ethereum network any good either. So you're, exactly. you're kind of not really contributing to the ecosystem if you're not at least uh, having some of your um, holdings actually out there staking and securing the network, benefiting from that. Is there, is there some of these transactions that don't go through where you lose your stake? Is that, is there, is that what happens in this staking environment or how, how, what, what's the risk to the staking on behalf of those things? Just a, if there yeah. is one on the other side of it. No, the, the, the risk is, is getting out of your staking. Like if you say, okay, I want to sell my Ethereum, you have to remove it from the staking validator and then you have to redeem it. So a closed end fund that has an annual redemption can stake 95 to 99% of its assets because it's, it's asset base is stable. So you're going to get a four to 5% yield on that one gross yield, right? The, an ETF that has a potential of 30, 40, 50% redemption in a black swan event can only stake half of that. So the, the yield, the gross yield on an ETF is lower than the gross yield on, um, a, a closed end fund, yet people are still buying an ETF that has no staking and paying a management fee on it. Right. That kind of falls into the, yeah, they don't get it yet. Right. They don't understand, um, cool. that, that concept. So that's, that's kind of how we, we look at it and we'll continue to educate and, and push things forward. You know, 
we're not going to be the biggest, you know, we hope we're the best, but we're not going to be the biggest, but you know, we just want to work with people and teach them and hashtag get off zero. Man. Awesome. Awesome. And, and, and lots of interesting stuff happening with the Japan connection too. That's, that's uh, very exciting. It is. Monix is controlled. Yeah. Monix is controlled by a company called NTT or not controlled, but 49% owned by NTT Docomo, which is probably one of the most powerful balance sheets in the world. So, uh, amazing. We're really, we're really excited about that. So where can people find you? What's the three IQ website, all that good stuff. Yeah. We're, we're, we're just three IQ cool. dot dot C or three IQ dot IO. Cause now we're a global company. So we've migrated from CA dot to, to dot IO. And then they can come see us in the Cayman islands. When I uh, stop by to have a pina colada with you. Love, Love it. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Do you have, do you have any personal address on Twitter or anything like that that you use? Or are you a behind the scenes kind of guy? Uh, Fred Pye can be found on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. Fred Pye at 3 Care. Beautiful. Well, okay. thanks for taking the time with us, uh, Fred. It was very insightful and uh, pulling back the, uh, the curtains a little bit for us. That's great. Thank you. My pleasure, Mike and Rod. It's good to see you both. Thanks, Fred. Take care. Sorry to interrupt, but I did want to take a quick second to remind our listeners that the team works really hard on these podcasts. We spent a lot of hours trying to get the right guests and we do a lot of prep work to make sure that we're asking the right questions. So if you do have a second, just do hit that subscribe button, hit that like button and share with friends if you find what we're doing useful. Thanks again.